Hi there, my name is Nico, I'm a shark biologist and I'll be running you through today's Great White Shark online lesson. So firstly, let's start off with the basic ecology and biology and maybe even some taxonomy of the Great White Shark. Okay? So firstly, where does the name Great White Shark come from? Well, there's lots of different names. You can either call it the Great White Shark, the White Pointer, or just the Great White. Okay, so this name originates from just the immense power and size of the shark. And it has the white underbelly and then the top black, grey or brown that actually can change colour. Um, they can get up to 7 metres in, in, in length, with females always being larger than males. And this is um, a term that we call sexual dimorphism, where we see that there is a change in sizes, um, some extra characteristics about an individual, but just because of their, their sexes. We also see great white populations throughout the world, right? We see them, if you're from the US, we see them in the northeastern coastline. We also see them um, in California. Um, we see them off Japan, Chile, um, Australia, here in South Africa. So they're kind of almost everywhere, right? And this just shows that they're definitely not a coastal system because how do they get there? So great white sharks also undertake these extremely long migrations okay that take place annually so i like to refer to them as two different populations we've got northern hemisphere population a southern hemisphere population so in terms of that the individuals that we see here in south africa we will never ever see them in you know um the us for example we won't see them in france they will always always go down to australia new zealand that's the area they'll migrate up and down and when you look at data and past research papers and things like that once these sharks are being tracked you actually see them cruising at a depth of about 900 meters and that's that's their cruising depth um, down here in the bay uh, well a bit further out at sea people have recorded them at 500 meters in depth that is extremely deep so it definitely shows that they're not a coastal species that we're going to see them right here behind me in five meters waters yes we do see them but they are able to go to these really, really, really deep depths. And that just shows you how, once again, they are adapted to survive at those depths. Some of the really cool adaptations or some of my favorite adaptations about them. So they actually have glow-in-the-dark eyes. So if you go out and we do some research um, and you're out either really, really early in the morning or late in the evening, if you shine the light onto them, they actually have these glow-in-the-dark um, eyes and this is because of a protective layer um, or like a third eyelid that they actually have and that reflects the light and that's why we see the glow-in-the-dark eyes. They also have something that I'd refer to as toxic blood. Um, toxic blood in the way that it is very very rich in some metals. Okay just like you and I have iron in our blood they have some other extra uh, metals in their blood that makes it very very toxic. Um, but this is an amazing adaptation for them because this allows them not to actually get any infections. So this makes, we've seen it on the boat, um, you would have a shark coming in that has these severe lacerations on it. And you think to yourself, you're like, wow, you know, a prop from a boat's motor is run over the shark, it's sliced it into bits, it looks like maybe sushi or something like that. But in fact, it actually heals over time and it's not a very long time within a month really you'll see that shark coming back and those scars would almost be healed entirely um, so it just prevents them from picking up any infections and this makes them the really apex predators that they are great white sharks also have this ability to survive in really a lot of ecosystems so a lot of people think that they might be a coastal species and that we just find them here but in actual fact not really they can actually survive in most temperate waters. So from temperatures ranging from about 12 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius and even upwards, they are warm-blooded. So they have the ability to actually regulate their body temperatures. Um, and this is done through a vast structure or system of little veins that run, run um, under their skin. So they can actually pump blood to vital organs and areas that they, they need um, to be you know, warm at, at certain temperatures. Um, and this allows them to thus be in all these different environments. So like here in Mossel Bay, it's very, very cold. We've got very, very cold water. So that's why they can thrive here. If you look at these little 
organs, um, sensory organs that they have on their snout. It's these little black spots. It's not freckles. It's not anything like that. It's actually called Ampulla of Lorenzini. And Ampulla of Lorenzini have the ability to pick up on the smallest minute magnetic or electromagnetic impulses. And this is how they can pick up on um, the heartbeats of fish or rays or anything like that. And that's how they'll actually go and um, find their prey. We've seen that a lot of time next to the vessel where if you stick a GoPro into the water, the little electric current that flows through your GoPro from your battery to the GoPro itself is strong enough and can actually be picked up by the Great White and we've seen that next to the vessel where if you chuck out a tuna head to try and bring in a Great White instead the Great White will actually go to a GoPro so sometimes a GoPro is a lot more effective than a big chunky you know yummy tuna head is what you would think a Great White would rather go for. They actually have this very very strong um, sense of smell and this is where in my opinion the media has really messed up okay and the reason for that is Yes, great whites and most shark species have the ability to pick up on a drop of blood, you know, in like really like a hundred liters of water. Okay, so they can certainly smell that, but it doesn't mean that they are necessarily going to go for that. We've seen that. There's so many papers that have come out that shows that great whites aren't attracted to human blood. That's why if they do eventually you know in some instances bite someone it's immediately release afterwards they'll bite and let go because they can taste that blood so to have this propaganda message going out that sharks can smell blood yeah that's true but just like i'm going to use this as an example my neighbors are mowing the lawn right and you can smell that fresh cut grass I can smell that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to go roll around in the grass, right? I can smell it, but it's not something that I'm attracted to. So I think it's very careful how the media should rather word, word some of these things. Great whites do something called spy hopping, where they can actually bring their head outside of the water and look with their eye. And I've said this a lot of times, great whites, when they look into your eye, there's something else behind there. They are so intellectual, they are so clever, and there's certainly something great excuse the pun, but great behind their head. Like in there, they have a soul. Um, and you'll see this when they, they do that spy hopping and bring their head out of the water. So there's two reasons for that. One, to see really well. And secondly, smell, tra well, scent um, travels much, much faster in the air compared to in water. So a lot of time they'll actually lift their head out of the water and actually smell. So this is what we'll see at a whale carcass or something like that, okay? So great whites, one, like I stated, are exceptionally intelligent. They're exceptionally curious and they have this absolute personality to them where they know that they are just tough and the big bad boys in the ocean, right? So when I say behavior, um, we do see that there's some sort of dominance. Um, it's very, very complex um, behavioral structures between them. We've seen this around the boat. Um, you can have three, four individuals around the boat at one time. But as soon as a big, when I say a big, I mean a big shark comes in, your small individuals will firstly leave. Immediately they will leave, the big one will come and make their passes, and then later on you'll see your smaller ones coming in. So there is some sort of hierarchy between them as well. Um, another thing is you never really see them hunting together. They're not pack animals. They're not going to congregate necessarily like we see in big migrations with hammerheads, for example. Now, here in Hartenbos, um, which is five minutes walk from where I currently am standing. If you look out of a helicopter or if you sit in a restaurant, you look down onto the beach, you can see five, six great whites swimming together. But once again, they'll come close to one another and then boom, they'll move away. They're not gonna swim together and hunt together. They're not friends. Even when they're born, the mom has no interest in them. She's not gonna raise them. It's not gonna be a baby. She's gonna let that pup go off. The pup will immediately make its way away. It's just how they've been, you know, how they've evolved. Um, interesting enough, there has been some reports of this almost like small wolf pack of three individuals that have hunted together. You'll find that in the notes later on, but I'm not going to go into much detail with that. I personally witnessed great whites feeding next to one another um, at a whale carcass uh, alongside tiger sharks, in fact. Um, and then they kind of go into this trance where once they feed on that whale, they'll munch and you'll just see them enjoying themselves. They literally 
eat so, so, so much because literally 30 kilograms of whale blubber can sustain them for several months. It's not just a little snack, it can sustain them for several months. Um, and yeah, they'll go into this feeding frenzy, they'll munch, and um, there's actually reports of great whites, you know, biting one another, and they're not being aggressive to one another. They just feed, 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 mistake one, bite someone, you know, they just carry on. It's almost like a wild, wild little feeding scenario, but there's no aggression towards one another. Well, we know that they certainly have a quite violent mating behavior. We've seen this in other shark species as well, where males will bite onto the pectoral fins of the female and kind of turn to the side and then they will insert one of their claspers into the female and that's um, how they will mate. Now males actually have two claspers, um, females also have two uteruses um, with several ovaries in them and they can actually give birth to up to 16 different pups. So baby sharks uh, are actually referred to as pups. The interesting thing is that even from the moment that these embryos start developing, they are programmed to develop as predators, apex predators in fact. So, you, um, pups that are in the uterus that are more developed than other pups that are still, you know, in the form of embryos, those larger pups or embryos will actually start feeding on the other less developed embryos, um, which leads to survival of the fittest. So only the strongest candidates will survive. Um, gestation period can take up to 11 months. And like I said, you know, 14, 16 pups can be born, but a lot of the time this is not the case. We see a lot less pups being born. Um, a lot of times when you see a pregnant, pregnant female that's washed out, that's dead, and they've been dissected, um, there's not, um, 16 pups in them so the majority of them actually don't have a lot of pups in them and this is why great whites are so under threat because they take such a long time to reach sexual maturity and when I say that it takes 23 years for a male and up to 34 years for a female to actually reach sexual maturity and then 11 months for them to give birth so this this period of time that it takes for them to actually reproduce is a significantly long time and thus if you even if you just lose one pup it will take such a long time before new pups can be born and thus um, we really have to protect the species. We are currently on the beaches here in Mossel Bay the current great white capital of the world. We are so privileged to be having these amazing species right here on our doorstep. And when I say on our doorstep, these sharks most of the year patrol right behind these waves behind me. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's actually a great white right behind me now, because that is where we see them on most, most days. So everyone thinks that great whites feed on seals, right? Now this is 100% true, but it's not their main diet or their staple diet. In fact, it's more of a seasonal shift. In South Africa, especially over our winter months, this is really when we see great whites coming in and feeding on the seals on Seal Island. And that is where you'll see those epic breaching moments with great whites just launching themselves out of the water. So this is obviously a very special adaptation that they have where they can just accelerate an immense power, shoot through there and just nail a seal and be successful when, when they hunt. This is also a very unique hunting behavior that we really only see here in South Africa. They've adapted their behavior also when it comes to hunting to different areas. If we go to a nearby town, it's about an hour and a half from here, when we go and do research over there and great whites come in to um, hunt seals, there's a totally different hunting behavior that we witness. So in our bay here, Mossel Bay, it's relatively deep. You're looking about 16 plus meters in depth. Uh, so that you know that that's close to what, 40 feet, if I'm not mistaken. But basically over there, well here, they have the ability to dive down, get that speed and then shoot out and be successful when hunting. In shallower bays, they can't do that. They can't dive down, they can't come up and, you know, hunt like that. So what we've seen them do is they kind of hide in the waves They'll be around seals and all of a sudden they'll shoot out and that's when they'll actually hunt. So the key point that I want to bring in is that great whites don't necessarily just feed on seals. And that leads me to my next point. 
Here in Mossel Bay, we have an extensive reef structure that runs all the way from this area behind me, which is called Dias. The following area is called Hartenbos, followed by Kleinbrak, Tergniet, Glentana, or Grootbrak, Glentana, etc. And along this whole area, we've got this vast, vast reef structure that is very, very shallow. And that is why we see these breakers behind me. That is where the reef structure starts, okay? And during the majority or the most part of the year, the Great White Patrol ride on this reef structure. And then they'll actually go and hunt smaller shark species like bronze whalers, um, some of our smaller shark species that we also find that are some endemic species. And they'll go for them in rays, skates, and even dolphins. Um, so occasionally we do get some dolphins that have been munched on by sharks because we need to remember that the Great White is an apex predator that is just designed to survive. So it will be very, very opportunistic and they will hunt larger prey. And we see this throughout the world. They do feed on porpoises, uh, smaller whale species, dolphin species, etc. This is why they are what they are. They're just so, so well adapted to survive. What we've noticed is directly after predation where killer whales or orcas have come in and actually killed and fed on a great white shark's liver because that's the only thing we've seen them going for. They've literally only been targeting the actual liver because remember the liver of a great white is not the size that you'll expect like in you and I. So it's not going to be a small thing, it's in fact a massive massive thing so it will sustain the orcas for also several weeks etc. Um, but yeah, getting back to the orca great white predation. Straight after predation takes place, there's a total deflection of the great white population from not just our region, but we've seen it in Falls Bay, Hans Bay. Falls Bay hasn't seen great whites for yo, several years. Hans Bay recorded like three sharks last year. Here in Muscle Bay, we have the privilege of seeing three, four sharks around the boat every day. Sometimes we, do, we go through some draft patches where we see them for a few, you know, 10, 12 days, maybe not, maybe two weeks, etc. But they always, always come back. And we're so, so thankful for that because we can still do our research on them. But straight after an orca attack, the total deflection takes place and it can take up to 60 days, literally sometimes or even longer, where we see no great whites. And that is what's so important for us to still focus research on that and to focus our research, especially on the marine dynamics that take place between great whites and orcas. Because the orcas aren't something new. It's maybe something new that we're really focusing on now but orcas aren't new to this environment, they've been here forever, so they've just kind of bumped the great white a little bit down in the food chain. Great white used to be at the top being the apex predator, but currently they're just uh, a little bit lower, just under the, the killer whale. There's been a lot of research focused on great whites. Um, even though we focus so much on it, we really don't know everything about them yet. Um, but I'm just going to run you through some of the, well, some of my favorite Great White research projects that we run here at the Shark Research Unit and that I'm part of and that I facilitate. So one of the things is photo identification. So Great White sharks are really cool in this aspect because each dorsal fin on each shark is actually unique to them. So whether you look at the small little notches in the, in the dorsal fin or just the pigmentation pattern or just some just the actual shape of the of the fin. That's unique to each one and through some really cool uh, computer programs and software we can actually map out that and that's how we identify each individual. Also when we get some underwater footage from them we can look at the gill pattern or the gill pigmentation pattern so we see that grey and white that goes over the gills. We can actually look at that and use that to identify individuals. And also then on the left and right side of the caudal so the caudal is the tail bit, that last big fin that you see on a great white. So there's pigmentation patterns, so you can have spots on it, there's certain notches on that. We can actually use that as well to identify each individual. So we are currently also busy in assisting with a big, big project where we're trying to see exactly how many individuals we have left in our waters. Um, last year our team was really su successful and we managed to identify 68 different great whites that resided here in Mossel Bay throughout the year. Um, 
taking into account for about four months we didn't see any great whites because we had the orca attacks that I spoke about on early on right so that was really really cool for us we managed to get quite a lot of data and we're really really happy about the numbers that we are currently seeing then another thing is we're doing something new called eDNA so environmental DNA where we're trying to work um, this is a really cool project where just from a simple water sample we're trying to be uh, just we'll collect the water sample, analyze that, filter it, and then we'll look at the environmental DNA. So environmental DNA is any DNA that's given off into the environment. So just like you and I, if we get into the water, um, our sweat, our skin, um, hair, all of that goes off and you'll be able to test that and get that from the water. Same with sharks. They give off also fluids. Um, and from their guns, anything like that, their skin, all of that comes off so you can actually then hopefully collect a water sample, analyze that and from that be able to determine what type of shark was there, how many sharks was there and then when last was the shark there. So I'm really excited about that. Also, I know I spoke about the really cool predations about great whites launching out and you know munching on, on seals. We're looking at something else here as well called mobbing behavior where you actually have big cape fur seal bulls jumping into the water and actually chasing off a great white. So it's something very interesting where the prey is now fighting back and fighting off this big, you know, apex predator. Um, we're also looking at the injury recovery rates. We're actually looking at how fast the sharks are healing. What are some of the big issues that we're seeing? Is it just prop strikes on them? Is it boat strikes? Is it do we see some fishing tackle in them? Is there entanglements on them? And that's a big study that we're currently running to try and determine if there's any regulations that government needs to put into place to help protect the species even more. Um, go and look at our website. All our research is also open source. If you require anything like that and you're affiliated with the South African University, we're always happy to share because we believe that sharing is caring and together we can make a change. People sometimes suggest, or some researchers have suggested that once they take these immense migrations, it is for feeding, um, it is for mating, or it is to be at congregation sites, okay? Because none, no one's really recorded uh, where they mate or where they give birth. There's been reports from fishermen in New Zealand, I believe, that actually said that they saw um, pups being born, but no one's been able to actually document that this. So hopefully we can do that very very soon but currently we're not 100% sure exactly where this is taking place. And this leads to the next part of the debate. So when we have these really really large individuals, now when I say large individuals I mean you, you know five, five plus meters in size. For them to hunt a seal is one, not beneficial, they use way too much energy in order to catch that seal and for them to sneak up on that seal is the chances is it's not really going to be, happen. The seals will see this immense small whale that will come up. So it's not going to be successful in hunting. Thus, their diets have shifted, okay? And we've seen this when it comes to whale carcasses. When you have a whale carcass, that's where you see big, big sharks coming in. And people have suggested that maybe it is a case of these big sharks migrating and they go down to those big, well, really, really deep depths to go and feed on whale carcasses. So if there's whale um, graveyards, maybe that's a congregation site where these sharks come together and that's where they'll feed. Currently, there's not a lot of research really that gives us a real clear indication of how many great whites we still have left in our waters. We certainly do know that great whites are endangered and we don't want them to go extinct, right? We are in this world where we have a lot of issues. We don't want to negatively affect our environments. We are currently, I think, in a generation where we really want to protect our ocean environments and the um, amazing species that we still have. So we should certainly you know, protect this, this species. Great whites have been around for millions of years. Sharks have been around for longer than dinosaurs. So they certainly do have a place here. And we know the importance of sharks because at the end of the day, what do they do? They regulate our reef systems, right? They are like what I refer to like the police in the ocean almost, okay? They are out there, um, they remove all the unhealthy fish. They 
manage the fish stocks, they manage our reef systems. If you want to look at the healthiness of a reef, you look at the shark population. If you have a lot of sharks, you know that it's a healthy system. So once again, it's so important for us to protect these shark species. Um, great whites are protected in South Africa. South Africa was actually the first country in the world to protect great whites. So that's really cool for us. And I think a lot of South Africans know how special these animals are. So yeah, um, just want to put it out there. We should really protect them. Um, they are just absolutely amazing. And they are certainly my favorite species to work with. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.